Hi, and welcome to the Restorative Wellness Clinician's Corner, a video series exclusively for functional health professionals, where we interview the top experts in the latest research, products, tools, and best practices for getting your clients exceptional results. So welcome everybody. I am so excited about this episode of the Clinician's Corner. Today we have Boris Berian. I don't know. Did I did I do okay? You got you got it. You got it. We just yeah. did it. We just did it. <laughs> Named uh, a pronunciation check. Um, and he is the founder and CEO of what has fast become my favorite CGM company, Thea Health. Um, and he's on a mission to change healthcare through innovation personalization, and engineering. His focus is on building projects that bridge the gap to understanding how the body works and how to optimize it. And he's got lots of experience in growth companies and seed stage companies. And Boris, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the awesome, awesome intro. I'm <laughs> excited to talk to everybody and your community has been awesome. I've already spoken to some of you. So I'm um, very, very excited. Yeah. Well, I want to just give everybody a little bit of background and context. So I have been playing around with CGMs and y'all have heard me talk about it and I've written about it a little bit. Um, I've been playing around with them now for hmm, at least two or three years. And I have really found them powerful tools in terms of understanding my own health, optimizing my training, really understanding what foods I can tolerate and not tolerate. Um, and even learning the impact of things like just general stress or a sauna versus a cold plunge or different types of workouts. I mean, it, the data has just been incredible. And with some of the other companies that I have tried, um, the, the real pain point is, I mean, it's fine when I'm using it for myself, but when I'm using it at, with a client, there becomes all of these hurdles. Um, there's been a question about the accuracy of the data that's coming in. Um, and some of the user interfaces are better than others. And just really as a as a practitioner, it's it wasn't it wasn't perfect yet. And I I was introduced to Thea by um, a mutual friend. And um, when he was telling me some of the pain points that um Boris and his team have solved, I was like, oh, this is this is a no brainer. I mean, in my, I mean, you, you all will be the judges for yourselves after, you know, our chat today. Um, but in my mind, this has really, truly solved so many of the pain points in terms of the cost, in terms of the accuracy of the data, in terms of being able to view your client's data, not these weird clunky screenshots or having them try to interpret it. Um, there aren't other nutrition professionals trying to like poach your clients from you and give them their dietary recommendations as opposed to yours. Um, so I'm really, I'm really excited about this, um, about this tool. And um, Boris, what I would love to start off with is just is your a little bit about your history and what inspired your interest in metabolic health and then CGMs in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was seven years old, I was diagnosed with, I'll start here. I was diagnosed with severe asthma. So I was on the puffers. I went on these retreats to try to get better, all this stuff. And, you know, they, the doctors were basically like, well, you have this for life, so just kind of deal with it. And by the age of nine, I had no more asthma, no more puffers, and I had above average lung capacity than some of my peers. And that was kind of the first time in my life where I was like, that was a disconnect because I was told something and then something else happened and I had some say in that. Fast forward to my early 20s, I actually got diagnosed with severe Crohn's disease. So my my uh, large intestine to my small intestine, that opening or that connection was almost closed due to the amount of scarring, scar tissue I had there. And so when I would eat like a bigger meal, it would get stuck in there. And then I'd basically it'd be at the hospital for like 30 hours and IVs. And I was scheduled for operation. You know, they were like, you're going through surgery, like you're going to have this for life. And I made a decision consciously this time where I was like, okay, hang on now. I don't want to do surgery. I don't want to, you know, get rid of my intestines. Let's just hire any doctor that I can think of. So I always say no one's beat me in this area. I had seven doctors at one point, all from different practices. So I had functional medicine doctor, holistic medicine doctor, an energy healer, a Chinese herbal medicine specialist, 
I had a gastroenterologist, an MD under my cover. I was just going to yoga classes. I think I read every book there is, like keto diets, um, plant-based, et cetera. I was working out and doing cardio. <laughs> so, oh yeah. And then I was meditating and listening to Buddha. And I went to pre-ops, I remember this, and they looked at me and they did the test and they're like, you know, we've never seen anybody get from your state. And by the way, I'm 6'4". I lost 50 pounds in three months. And so when people saw me, it was almost like you can't not react. You had to say something or like, are you dying? <laughs> Basically, and I was like, kind of, I don't know yet. Uh, it, I can say it playfully now. It wasn't a joke back then. And so in pre-ops, they're like, man, you got, you got a lot better really fast. It must be. And I was on a low dose of immunosuppressants at that time. And they're like, oh, the medicine must be working. I'm like, yeah, but I'm also doing like a hundred other things. They're like, yeah, 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 that doesn't matter. It's it's the medicine. And I was like, that's kind of odd, but okay. And I, by this like, you know, skin of my teeth, I basically avoided surgery in the last second by doing all of these things, spending thousands of dollars. But I was extremely frustrated. I mean, to put that story from long to short, I took two years, I got better built a business, traveled the world, went to Thailand eating spicy food. I can eat a whole pint of ice cream now. I can eat a whole pizza. Not that I do these things on a regular basis, just to, just to, just to be clear. you know. But it was basically nowadays I can do whatever I want and my immune system doesn't go absolute haywire. I'm off every single medication. And then my last colonoscopy, I got a, you know, my doctor did it with me and he gave me a sheet that says zero signs of disease found in your colon or your small intestine. So again, I was like, that's the second time I was told I can't do this. And I did it. And this time was a lot more conscious, it cost me an extraordinary amount of money, time and effort, of course. <laughs> and I think that was one of the most frustrating parts was a lot of the doctors or the advice or the the concepts that I was getting a lot of the time would contradict each other. Mm -hmm. We should do this elimination. No, we should do that. That does food doesn't matter. It does matter. You should go on extremely hardcore drugs. You should go on the lower immunosuppressant first, right? So getting second or third opinions almost didn't help in terms of having mental clarity. And then the last thing was, I was like a therapist to my family because they are all crying about it or trying to pamper me. And I was like, guess it does not help. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm supposed to have some rocks in my corner and I'm getting none of that and I'm kind of helping you. And so after those two years of really getting the health back uh, and I, I kind of was on the back of my head, always thinking there, there has to be some way we can objectively understand what's going on. Like if I, I used to buy, I don't know if you remember those goji berries. We had that goji berry craze. I would buy those like $100 bottles of goji berries. And now looking back, I'm like, were they any better than blueberries? <laughs> you know, like in terms of like antioxidant and vitamin, but you do whatever you can because when you're sick, you don't really care. You're just trying to get better. And through my journey as building businesses, as um, you know, when I was intro, <clears throat> I, re I really always paid attention to if there was a way to objectively show data to all these doctors and have them on the same page, or at least have a better relationship, or we're using something that's not high in the sky or a philosophy that they've been preaching over tens or 20 years, whatever that case may be, then we could have maybe got the result faster, or I would know not to spend money in the goji bears. I'm just picking on them for fun, but you know, I would know not to spend money maybe on three out of the seven doctors or like take them at different times when one thing healed and the other thing didn't. And that was like one of those things that always stuck with me. And so going further into my career, I went into my early 30s and I, I really wanted to do something in health to kind of solve that problem. And the aha moment was CGMs. So I was like, oh, hang on a second. Finally, you know, there's a biomarker that's actually useful that is a correlated to pretty much every metabolic disease there is in the world. That's a huge problem right now. And my metabolism was obviously a mess back then too. So I was like, okay, I need to do something with this technology. And so we kind of went down this path of, okay, let's just start testing it. So just started putting them on. I hate needles, like deadly scared of needles. I've tried so many ways to not be... <laughs> 
I'm the, I'm the type of person in the room that's like, all right, put me on a bed, talk to me, have my phone playing a video, pat my like self on the shoulder while you're doing it kind of, kind of needle guy. Um, and so when we first put them on, I was like, oh, I really don't want to. And then I put it on, didn't even feel it. And then I was like, oh, this data is really, really useful, even raw, because I had some background in, you know, healing myself and I've always studied nutrition and stuff like that. But then I kind of clicked where I was like, if I can bridge the gap of the massive problems I've had in healthcare, where it's the providers and the consumer can have a way to connect each other that's meaningful, then that would be a business I would love to build and, and really put into the market. And that was really the starting point. We, we went from there, we started iterating, started talking to doctors, providers, nutritionists, nurses, health coaches, et cetera, to see like what the, would they want in such a technology? How can it be actionable? You know, not time consuming, all the things that you don't want on top of your plate as a busy professional. And, and we went at it and now, now we're starting to, to really get some traction and, and really build cool products for practitioners such as yourselves. That's awesome. That's awesome. It is always, it's often that story of our own personal challenges and pain that like, you know, has us and I think all of us can either relate personally, or we've had many, many clients like you who have gone <laughs> through the medical system and have had just like been given the, such a just just gone around and around and around and not gotten anywhere. So um, this is, and I agree with you, the, the data is profound and it's really meaningful because of the fact that it's continuous, right? And I think yeah. everybody here, I'm, I'm making the assumption that everyone here understands what a CGM is, but actually let's just like take a tiny little step back just in case somebody's new. Can you just do a super quick yep. explanation of the difference between um, blood work, a finger prick test and a CGM? And then when we would be thinking about using this with a client? Yeah, absolutely. So a blood test is you go get your blood, you get fasting, glucose or not, depending on what it is. A finger prick is similar where it takes a bit of your blood and shows you your glucose at that point in time. Both of those tests are point in time tests, which that can vary all the time. And we were actually testing finger pricks. I wasn't because of the needle thing. <laughs> My co-founder, on the other hand, had no more fingertips left how much we were testing it. So, you know, the problem with it was always that I always say this, I'm like, blood work is great. And it has indicators for sure. But if I ate McDonald's for three days in a row, and then got a blood test versus a five day fast, I could skew those results. So I could, you know, drink for three months and then do a three day fast and it would show differently on the test. I'm not saying there wouldn't be indicators that something's not wrong because if you're drinking all the time, of course, there's going to be long-term consequences, but it it just gives you that snapshot, And but you're not getting any moving averages. You're not getting anything that um, is showing you over time how it's changing or not and what's impacting it, right? So a CGM is is a continuous glucose monitor, which if you look at my arm I'm wearing right now, uh, right there, and this is monitoring my blood sugars basically in five minute intervals, and then it's streaming into an app. And so the reason I loved the technology was because everything that I'm doing day to day, I'm going to be able to see now in one capacity, in one biomarker, which is related to metabolism, how those things are responding over days or times or even hours without having to prick my finger every minute, which, you know, I don't think anybody in the world wants to do <laughs> all the time. So that's the main difference is this is the first time we have something that's a data set that's streaming your body's data at all times in the day, even when you're sleeping, showering, going through, um, you know, triathlons, whatever you're doing. And in terms of how is that useful for practitioners, I kind of like to give the stat of 99.999% of patient care is actually out of office or maybe out of Zoom calls in the modern day, right? And so when the client leaves your office, they might be motivated. You guys are awesome at doing your job. You understand what they need to do. You give them a game plan. That's not the issue. The issue has always been when they leave, they're now in the same environment that got them sick, right? Oh, their friends want to do this. 
oh, the wife wants to do that. Oh, we're going to go eat hot dogs on the weekend because that's what we've always done. So they can only have so much willpower. But if their body's data is showing them in that minute what's going on, then we can at least intervene and you could check on them more often or frequently or have ways to check on them where if you need to intervene and say, hey, we need to get on a call, we can, we can alter their lifestyle decisions in real time and those can be sustainable. And then over a long period of time through that data show, hey, all the little implementations we've done, let's just call it over a year or six months or whatever, look where it's gotten us and we can prove it now, right? And that was the mechanism that I was always looking for. I love it. I absolutely love it. So when we think about blood sugar, of course, you know, there's obvious case uses for this, right? So somebody has insulin resistance, they've been diagnosed as pre-diabetic. <laughs> You're very specifically thinking about blood sugar. But of course, that is not all the, it's not just when you are, for example, seeing imbalanced blood sugar on labs or your client comes to you with one of these diagnoses. Can you share some of the other use cases for a CGM outside of the just absolute obvious of a an overt blood sugar dysregulation? Yeah, absolutely. We actually have more people that use it for use cases outside of a diabetic type one or two or uh, insulin resistant or even pre-diabetic. I mean, mo a lot of people are pre-diabetic, but they have other symptoms, right? So if somebody has PCOS or they're trying to get pregnant, you know, through your training, I'm sure you all know optimizing blood sugar is going to have a huge impact on that because it's how your metabolism is responding. If somebody's trying to lose weight and they they're trying everything, they're on a low carb diet or whatever, whatever they're doing, they might actually not be right because there's all these sauces and in, in their salads or they put croutons they don't tell you about or whatever the case is. We can now double check and be like. Well, you think that you're not spiking your glucose, but you might be really, really spiking it. And it could be as simple as just crushing a lot of fruit, for example, thinking that's good to go and it's not, right? Um, people with brain fog, energy, who, who ha don't have mental clarity, they don't know why. The 3 p.m. crash for the executive, right? Oh, I get tired at three, my work kind of diminishes. Why? Well, you had burgers and fries and a Coke for lunch. The person that's traveling, right? Oh, I'm going to Hong Kong for a business meeting or I'm going to this three time zones. What do I do? How do I get into focus? Or how do I get to my meetings? Okay, let's measure your blood sugar and try to get it into, into a nice state as fast as possible. So we've seen it. And then obviously like, there's things like athletes, they want the edge on everything, right? And so I don't know your clientele bases necessarily, but... I'm just trying to give a scope of range of ways that you can apply it because it's always relating back to the one thing, which is optimizing metabolic health. I love it. I love it. Um, so what are, I mean, and I will share personally, I've used it not for, I mean, mine was always about, I'm, I'm a marathon runner and sort of figuring out what's happening to me during training runs. And if I'm bonking, like what's, you know, it's been fascinating understanding and being able to really tweak my fueling in a, in a way that's so much more granular than anything I was able to do before, before it was just guesswork and based on how I felt. And now it's, I'm able to like really, really fine tune things based on the type of workout, the time of day, what I ate the day before. Like I'm really able to dial it in, in a way that is unlike anything I would be able to do without this. Um, so let's talk about some of, um, some of the clinical, so the added clinical benefits, one of the things you talk about the added edge athletes want as practitioners, we're always looking for that added edge. Like how <laughs> can we get our clients feeling better faster? Right. Yeah. So can you share some of the, some of the outcomes that you've seen with practitioners who've integrated this into their offerings? Yeah, absolutely. I think the way I would summarize a CGM in terms of what it does for the consumer relating back to the practitioner is that when you tell somebody to do something and they see an impact of your advice right away, it's the immediate feedback loop. Oh, Dr. So-and-so or nutritionist so-and-so or health coach so-and-so told me this. It actually worked, right? Because if you tell somebody, hey, do this for three months and you're going to get the outcome, after two weeks, they'll be like, okay, 
you know, I haven't really lost the weight, so whatever. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think the number one benefit is that you're getting them to stay on your program or your guidelines for a much longer period of time, right? And if they are staying on it, you're getting the results, which then is word of mouth, referrals, can be in your marketing. You're, you're providing a standard of care that's better than they had before simply because they have a mechanism to check what you're, you know, they probably trust you 100%, but when they see it in the moment, three weeks after you're meeting with them and it's still working, and they're like, okay, I should probably just keep doing this. Right. Um, the other thing is it takes a lot of your time. Well, the way we've built it anyway, right? so the raw data doesn't necessarily do this, but the way we built it was you can pull reports on your clients whenever you want. So now we're saving practices a lot of time in terms of, when they come back to you, how did you eat? How'd you sleep? And they probably, you know, fudge the numbers. I slept pretty good or I ate pretty good. It's like, what? what's pretty good? You know, is it four hours? Is it five hours? Did you, what was a pretty good diet? You know, what did you eat uh, foot long subs or were they actually small sandwiches? And so we're giving you that data now where it's like, where's the snapshot of this person? Okay, this is how they performed. When they come in, I don't have to spend those 15 minutes or so of the back and forth. Data is already there in the report that you want. You can just action item them, strategize them. And then now you have a new data stream that you never had before in your clients that's actually useful in the way that you want to see it. Um, you can get through clients faster. You're giving, you have that connection to them at always whenever you want to check in if you want to. And then the other thing is you can now take on more clients. That's our whole goal, right? So we're trying to make you more scalable through giving you technologies that optimize all the tedious work that you had to do before. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, I think it's also, I mean, you talk about that, you, you're able to see the impacts immediately. Like if I, the number of people I have had to tell them, you know, for example, that oatmeal isn't necessarily the best breakfast <laughs> for most people, having them wear a CGM and watching, you know, watching them with that oatmeal you know, and then I've had, I've had some clients like really, really resist it and love their oatmeal. So it's like, you know, every day they were adding more things to the oatmeal to try to make the <laughs> blood sugar spike till they're ending up with like this tiny little bit of oatmeal and like all the like nuts and the ghee and the this and yeah. the, all these things to try to like add protein and fat to modulate the <laughs> sugar spike to the point where you're like, is this even oatmeal anymore? But um, right. yeah, I think it, it's such a powerful tool. Can you, I want to, I want to talk about some of the, the actual technology here in a second, but can you just like, what's the most unusual CGM use you've come across so far? Oh, uh, this, I'll give you a funny one. We had somebody logging haircuts all the time and we're like, they're like, we want to see what I'm like, why, you know, so I reached out, I was like, you know, I don't think a haircut is like necessarily the best use of your time. If you're going to optimize food, nutrition, whatever. And then I realized, I'm like, I think they're playing 3D chess on me because they were trying to figure out if their hairstylist gave them anxiety. And that would actually show, like we've seen a lot of the time, if you're stressed, your blood sugar goes up. And I was like, oh, I would have never, I would have never logged a haircut to find that out. But that was a really like roundabout way. Um, but I mean, in, in terms of like non-funny things, we're seeing a lot of people come on and they're gonna, they want to try peptides, which are now popular, or they're doing stem cells. So like, oh, I want to get a baseline, do stem cells, then see what happens. I want to do a baseline, then do peptides, see what happens. Ozempic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we get a lot of those use cases, but yeah, I, I never thought anybody would be tracking haircuts probably is, is the most unusual one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the tech here and some of the science behind it. Can you explain the algorithms that you have used for your tracking? Because what you're doing here is you're taking that raw data and you're adding kind of a value assessment to things like a meal, like rating the meal on a scale, rating a day. How how are you coming yeah. to those? You know, is it just about the spike, how quickly it resolves, how high the spike is? Like, what is the data and how are you assessing it? Yeah, so we, we really implemented two scoring systems. One is a daily metabolic score. And we made that zero to 100 with bars that go around that are basically red, yellow to green. Mm -hmm. And the reason we did that was since grade one, everybody understands 100 at 100 on a test is great. So we're trying to always leverage users, behavior users understand, right? They know 100 out of 100, okay, I don't have to do anything. They know a yellow means yield, maybe take a look. And a red means really take a look. And a green means 
you know, good, good to go, whatever. So we're not necessarily trying to marry them to the app or have them use it all the time, but when they do use it, it should be useful. Um, the way we get those scores is what we're doing is taking your, like for the daily score anyway, we take the average last 24 hours and we look at things like, what was your average glucose throughout that whole time? How, many, how much variability did you have during that 24 hours? What was the maximum that you went to? Did you go over 30 basis points at any time or did you go under 30 basis points at any time? And then we're just taking all that data and giving one big score that's saying like, hey, this is how you're doing overall. And if you need to dig in, you can dig in. Once you do dig in, every single activity you log gets a score. And that's scored a little bit differently, which obviously feeds into the daily score. But if you have a food, what, we, what we're doing is we're taking, okay, what was the baseline glucose when you started eating? What did the maximum go to three hours post? What did the minimum go to? How long did it take to stabilize? Was it 30 minutes, one hour? Was it all three hours and it's still up there? Right. So those are all the levers that we're looking to pull and look at, okay, how do we score this? And this is an ongoing thing, right? So it's always changing. Um, so those are really the two ways that we look at it because we need it to be easy to understand for the end user. And then for the provider to have a snapshot, and understand what's going on. And then obviously you can always dig into the data further clinically if you want to, but we're trying to not make you do more work and make it easy for your clients to do the work. I like that. I like that a lot. Totally selfish personal question. Is it possible to get a hundred on a food? I've never gotten anything beyond a 95 and I am a high achiever <laughs> at hundred, and it is driving me crazy. Is it possible? <laughs> so that's a little bit of gamification because you can't get over 95. Currently. Oh, okay. Well, that makes me feel better because I'm like, my goodness, I just ate the perfect meal and my blood sugar like didn't budge and I feel fantastic and I still only got 95. Okay. So that, to your point, we actually did that on purpose for two, two reasons. So one of the things that we do is we allow the pr practitioner to change the bands and the scoring according okay. to the client, right? So if you have a professional athlete yeah. and they're getting 95s all the time, we can tighten the scoring so they right. can get those micro optimizations. Right. Al alternatively, again, it's like every individual is different. If you have somebody who's 370 pounds obese, and even one meal doesn't affect their sugar. Like, you know, one meal doesn't affect their whole day. Like they have terrible blood control and they're getting 50s or 45s every single day, even though they're improving themselves, they're going to get demotivated and say, well, I might as well just eat seven cakes because, you know, all of my efforts were in vain. Right. So that's one of the things we really focused on because we are a provider first is we can make those bands go up and down. So that you, like you said, you're a high achiever. So we're like keeping you a little bit motivated by saying there's still a little bit. I mean, the gig's up now, but you know, Funny. there's a little no, bit of room for you to go. Or if you're getting a 50, okay, let's let's try to get them to maybe like if yeah. they can get to the 60s or like low 70s, so they feel good about themselves, right? So there's always that psychology behind. We got to make sure the person is either motivated or isn't feeling down on themselves. Right. I think that's fantastic. And I didn't realize there was actually the ability to like tweak that because you're right for a certain client profile, I can really see the value of, of skewing that slightly differently. Now let's talk about those activities. You know, I'd, I'd posted to our practitioner Facebook group earlier today about questions and a lot of people commenting, commenting in there. And I even see it here in the chat of doing certain activities that we know are beneficial for our health. And yet they yeah. cause a spike in blood sugar. So really classic examples would be a really hard workout um, or um, anything in heat, typically. Um, I know for some people, cold, although in my experience, cold tends to drop blood sugar while heat tends to increase, whether that's a hot shower or a sauna or a hot bath. Um, but these activities we know are really healthful, and yet yeah. then they have this um, sort of a negative score, um, which can mess with you if you're somebody <laughs> who is, uh, again, a high achiever and trying to get that, um, that number. So can you explain a little bit about that and some of the things that you guys are doing with that? Because it's a different thing. If I sit in the sauna for an hour and my, my, my blood sugar spikes, it's a totally different thing from sitting down and eating pizza. Yeah, 100%. So, so two things on that. Our next app update, saunas, cold plunges, and activities, whether it's zone zone two, zone three, zone, whatever zone cardio yeah. or high intensity workouts, we're going to have not be part of this scoring. Awesome. 
and not be part of your daily score, or it will be, sorry, it will be a positive impact in some capacity. So we're working out that algorithm right now, because obviously those are great things for you. I remember I first went into a cold plunge. I went to like 200 glucose and I was like, what did I eat? And I was like, oh no, my body is just producing sugar. It looks like to keep warm. Um, so that's already in the pipeline. And then the second thing is, I forgot the second thing, but that's the main thing. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. We're going to be pushing, the way we're building now is when the blood sugar is raising, we want to get more contextual data if they're not logging. So we're going to say, hey, did you just eat Skittles, have a fight with your family member, or are you in a sauna? Right. Very different reactions, very different reasons that glucose would be going up. Okay. Some of them good or like very beneficial. Some of them maybe neutral. And then some of them is like, okay, we should probably minimize that behavior in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's talk, actually, I want to just, um, I want to ask about accuracy, because that's one of the questions that we yeah. often get. It's like, especially if somebody is comparing it to a finger prick, um, and then there's been critiques about some of the different sensors, which ones are accurate, yeah. which ones are not accurate. So can we, let's have that conversation about the accuracy. And then if you can talk yeah. about why you picked the sensor that you picked. For sure. So this was actually a make or break in the business. When we first started using the monitors, I had a really good friend get really mad at me because they were doing finger pricks and the glucose monitor and it was completely different. Like it was like not even close. Mm -hmm. So I sent him another sensor, same thing. I sent more finger pricks, other brands of sensors. And then, uh, yeah, like basically he was not happy with the data. And then we kind of spent a week saying, okay, we should look at the clinical trials because to me it was shocking that they could be so far off given that you're dosing insulin on these devices, right? I was like, how can you pass FDA testing? You could be off 40 or 80 basis points. I'm like, if you tell somebody to not take insulin or to take it at a certain dose and it's inaccurate, it doesn't make sense to me. So really, because the devices were all made for diabetics, that's what they did clinical trials on. So the higher the glucose the more accurate the devices are. CGM specifically, I'll get back to finger pricks. So the lower the glucose, the less accurate it can be. And then there can also be inaccuracies between sensor to sensor, right? So you could put a sensor on, have a baseline, put another sensor on, have a different baseline. You could put a different brand on, have a different readings and, and so on and so forth. But then we were starting to test finger pricks and we noticed discrepancies in those as well. And then I was like, wait a second, again, you're dosing insulin, et cetera, et cetera. So we learned it was not a perfect science at this point, uh, even between the finger pricks and the sensors. And the reason we still built the company was that we understood, you know, the raw glucose doesn't actually matter. It's not something you can control as a person. The only thing you can control is your inputs right? So food you eat, activity that you do, whether you relax or meditate, those are the things that will make those raw numbers clinically come to come to places that you like. And so that's why we actually had to build the scoring. And we really started with raw data. And then we realized nobody understood it, especially consumers. Practitioners didn't want to interpret it that way. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it got really combobulated and then it was off, right? So we said, okay, as long as with the activities that you're putting in, if we can optimize the spikes up or down drastically, then we know the averages, the, even if the raw data is off by a little bit, is coming down, it's subjective to the data you started with to the data that you ended with, right? Um, and over a longer period of time, you, you should see those averages come down. So we really stuck with scoring the activities and giving you a daily score and taking into consideration all that as context, um, you know, in terms of how to build the app, because those are the things that really, really matter. It's not so much what the actual number is. Again, that's not something I, I can't flick my finger and say, okay, glucose go down now, right? right? <laughs> Unless I'm taking drugs or something like inter intervention and in, in insulin, whatever that case is, right? So that's why we built it the way we are. And ba we're banking that, you know, as we keep going, they'll get more and more accurate. For example, Abbott has already basically discontinued finger prick R&D. They're all in on CGMs to perfect that data and make it accurate as possible going forward. 
But again, to me, it's like the raw numbers don't really mean much. It's in context of where did you start from and how did those averages move up or down, right? And then you know that you're doing a good job to your health. Absolutely. So yeah. can we talk a little bit about the Freestyle 3 versus a lot of the other CGM companies use Freestyle 2 or the, I think yeah. it's the Dexcom, right? Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the differences and why you chose this one over the others? Other than that, it's smaller and, and cuter. I'm wearing mine right now too. It's not so <laughs> yeah, like in your face. Absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't get caught on things quite as easily as the others. Yeah. So technically, if you look at Freestyle Libre versus uh, Dexcom, those are basically the two sensors on the market. If you look at the clinical trials, the Freestyle Libre was like 95th interval of accuracy and the Dexcom is like 96, 97 Again, I'm like, we're nitpicking like one percentage here or there. It doesn't really matter, especially in healthy individuals where you're not dosing insulin. It doesn't matter as much, sorry, right, to have it that accurate, especially how we're how we're building, how to look at the data. And the Dexcom is like, if you're going to start, it's like $500 just for your first month to start using it without insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, the Libres were much more affordable, basically one to 120 per sensor if you're going to start. So we really start with the Libres, first the 14 day and then the twos to test those. But as soon as the threes were available to us, which we made some good partnerships to get them, the three has kind of really been key because not only is it the size of a penny, the Dexcoms are massive, the old freestyles are pretty massive. Let's be honest, there was huge friction points and people being like, I don't want to wear this, I look sick. All these misconstrued conceptions about the device, right? Uh, it's also always on, right. which is kind of the key, meaning the data streams through Bluetooth to your phone, so you don't have to tap it anymore. Right. You used to have to tap to get the data, and sometimes would have people wait eight, seven, six hours before they get the data onto the phone, and then they don't have that loop of, I just did something, here's what happened. Right. It could have happened eight hours ago, and they don't care anymore, right? So we really didn't like that approach, and then the footprint of the actual thing, as you mentioned, was huge. Uh, so we're we're currently the only ones with the Freestyle Libre 3 on the market, and we're the only ones that built off the Libre 3 with the always-on data in mind first. I know some of the other competitors might have some difficulty because they built it on the tap. Right, 100%. Yeah. So um, now with that, the data constantly feeding in, there's been a bunch of questions about EFM. And <laughs> yes. then there's the, I want to talk about just the logistics of, because we talked a little bit beforehand about the fact that um, yeah. this app, of course, being designed or not, that this is the actual sensor um, itself, not Thea. This is out of Thea's control, but um, sensor itself is designed, as you said, for diabetics. And so too low, too high is a really serious situation in those cases. And so they have alarms that are surprising allow loud um things like do not disturb does not um that these alarms go way over that and can um as i learned the very first night um i was perhaps taking a little too much berberine and my blood sugar was tanking remarkably and we were woken up multiple times in that first night with um with quite a shock so can you can you talk a little bit about those pieces yeah absolutely emf i totally get it i'm i try to minimize as much as possible the nice thing about the threes is you can use it like the other ones, which is tap. So they hold eight hours of data. So if you want to turn Bluetooth off and tap every eight hours, it will still transfer the data. So if you're not needing it in that second, the data, and you don't need to action it, no problem. I always tell people at night, I turn my phone on airplane mode. If you decide not to do that, you can just turn the Bluetooth off. Those alarms are not going to go off. You can turn off every single alarm except for one which is the low glucose score because it's, I think it's a legal thing. They, they basically make you have it on there. Uh, as long as the phone is on airplane mode and that's below 55 MG per DL. So if you hit that, it'll go off. But again, turn Bluetooth off whenever you want and then tap it or just at night if you don't want as much uh, EMF exposure, which I don't do at night as well. Um, so those are like the best practices we're trying to work on not having those because again, if you're putting it on non-diabetics who don't need to dose insulin, it's not necessary. Um, it's just a little workaround. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I realized I was going to stop my questions 10 minutes ago and you've got <laughs> some, some presentations and pieces so that folks can see how this all works. So I'm going to turn yeah. it over to you. And yeah. um, I know we've, we've, we've covered some of the things you were going to talk about, but 
Awesome. Yeah, I'll skip over some of the slides. So I'll I'll kind of show you everybody how we work with practitioners, providers, uh, what we offer them, and some of the back end how that looks for you, both for you and for the for your patients and clients. So we're Thea, we power health businesses with biosensor tracking. Just a call out to CGMs are the first biosensor we have. We want to make every single one that comes down the road available to you uh, as part of a package. So you don't have to worry about how do I get this tech? How do I get that tech? Uh, we also allow practitioners to earn industry leading commissions because again, we're trying to empower you to be able to grow your practice and impact more people. You're already doing it. So it's like, why not empower the provider? Um, real quick, the problems we started with, I kind of mentioned was without immediate results, people fall off the bandwagon and then gathering data from them is tedious and extremely subjective with simple bio data scoring and then logging things. And I'll show you how they do that. We kind of take care of that. And then if you guys are earning commissions and you have new technology, that's been very inaccessible, especially to this market. Uh, you can actually stand out in the marketplace and be ahead of the curve um, against the competition. I mentioned the, the sensors, so we're going to kind of skip that given the time. Uh, this is the logging. I wanted to call out here, when people are logging, we really try to push them. They can do anything, feelings, uh, exercise, diet. We really push them to take photos for two reasons. One, Everyone, again, user behavior, they know. They know how to take photos for Instagram where they're kids on vacation, right? So get them to take a photo. It's a very, very low effort for them to do so. Or they can upload it later too if they need to. The second thing is you as a practitioner get to see context on what they're doing. So if somebody says, hey, I ate a small sandwich and you look and it was a foot long sub, there's a discussion to be had now. <laughs> well, we have very, very different uh, perceptions on what small is, right? Or like I had a salad, why did it spike? Okay, let's take a look. You had ranch sauce or whatever. Was there sugar? Did you add ketchup? Did you hide the croissant that we see in the picture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are like the two reasons we really push for that, um, that functionality. This is an overview of the scoring. So this is the daily score and this is the, the activity score. We, we obviously have visual events as well on the app. So if they ate a taco, it would show here, they can click on it and get the activity score there. Uh, this is the exciting part for providers, which is the metabolic dashboard. So this is a timeline report you can run for any of your patients or clients, which is basically like, hey, how did Boris do last month or last week or between this date and this date? And then we show you how many spikes I had, what my time and range was, my average glucose, average daily scoring, et cetera. We also give you the graph so you can kind of see where, where the spikes were and you can click on those icons to see what spiked. And then the last thing is you have a timeline of activities down here with a search bar. So if you're advising clients, hey, eat eggs with morning meals, for example, you could search for eggs and see every time they ate and ate a meal with eggs and see if there were scores that were you know maybe above 80 and then ones below 60 and see what differences were in, in their eating habits. Uh, there's a user onboarding dashboard for you as well. So if you are running, let's say programs like a metabolic reset three month, or you're doing something in that capacity, or you're just wanting to track where people are at, uh, they got consulting with you or whatever the case is, you can always come here and see where they are in the process because there's hardware involved. We ship it to them. They have to put that hardware on. They have to sync it to the app, right? So there's there's a few processes here that, you know, if you're like, hey, what's Sarah doing? Oh, she's still waiting for a sensor. No problem, right? So we're just giving you transparency in that backend so that you're not ever worried about what your clients are doing, especially if you're launching something and uh, you need them all on the sensor. Uh, we have company management we built out for you. So if you have other doctors, providers, nutritionists, health coaches, you want your assistant involved, you can invite them to your provider account and they can see your client's data as well. So now you can have everybody that works in your organization have this data uh, to varying degrees, right? Uh, that's really up to you. Uh, we also pay out commissions. I'll get, get into in a second, but we have a dashboard for your commissions as well. So when a new user buys, you'll see that you earned a commission. You have your links here that you can always share, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then you have your payouts down here that show you when we're paying you out, when we paid you out, et cetera. 
We also built a provider resource section. So we've been making a lot of documentation on how to implement this into your practice, right? So we have this hardware and the software, like how do I use that best? Do, can I? Can you give me marketing material? So we built some webinar templates that you can use. We built email sequences that you can use or, or pull from, uh, and we keep putting this in there as we get more questions. Uh, we also like to make your life easy, like I said. So we make a co-branded landing page for you, so you don't have to do anything. It's already optimized for sales. That's kind of, you know, I have a marketing background. So really, we just give you this landing page. You can use out of the box, get sales, earn commissions. It's already optimized for sales. And now, again, it's a very, very low amount of effort on your end to now integrate this into your practice. Uh, how we compare to others, so I'm sure... A lot of you have heard of Levels or Nutrisyn, Cygnos or very. Again, we are the only ones that are truly provider first. We have the best sensors and the best pricing. Um, I'll get into that in a second. We do give you the best commissions as a provider, and we are aggressively integrating with other integrations, right? So EMRs and stuff like that that you guys are already using we want to make sure that, hey, you can have that data in the places you're looking the most often as snapshots. And then if you need to dig into more, it can come into our app. So trying to make life as easy as possible. I just want to interject there. One example yeah. of this, you all heard um, Jeremy um, come from Biocanic. He was speaking a, a month or two ago, um, and he's um, this is the Thea is in, integrated with Biocanic, correct? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. Jeremy's awesome, by the way. <laughs> Okay, cool. So our pricing, and this is for users, just to be clear, um, is we have an annual membership. So this is $149 a year. So they're getting app access for the whole year. They're getting weekly insight reports. I want to make sure that I say this clearly. Our weekly insight reports are not other dietitians or other people telling your clients what to do. They're only showing them how they did from last week to this week and then we're giving them like their top three best foods or their top three worst ones they can dig into so we're never actually giving any nutritional or diet or lifestyle advice because you we want you to run your programs the way you are and we're just kind of the the backbone or the software backbone of making sure that they are doing that in your eyes and that they're following what you're doing right uh, we give them unlimited support in terms of you know, how to put the sensors on, sensor replacements, sometimes they come off, it just happens, or you you scratch it with the pillow or whatever the case is. Uh, so all of that, we handle, we handle all the onboarding for you. So again, we don't really want you to do any work on this end. It's kind of like a patient buys from you, we ship them the sensors, we onboard them, you get the data and that's it. Um, and then the cost per CGM is $75 per sensor. This is very, we tried very hard, very, very hard to get this cost. There was the number one request. How do we get lower cost CGMs, right? So what we did was we got it down to 75. This is very, very equivalent to a good RX coupon code in most states. They're about $68, but we include a prescription, a pharmacy fee, and we free ship to their doorstep, right? So again, go after user behavior. They understand. They understand, go to Amazon, buy something, comes to my doorstep quickly. Okay, great. Let's do that, right? Instead of hey, here's a prescription, go to your pharmacy. They may or may not have that sensor, or they may not may or may not deny you. Then go home, read this pamphlet, and get this app, right? It's like very very combobulated experience. Um, cool. I know we are short on time, so I'm trying to hurry this. Um, <laughs> the commission for you as a business is we pay a fifty dollar commission per yearly membership sold back to you. Um, there's no contracts. We give you the personal landing page. And every time your user that goes through your page or your signup link gets, gets pays, they get a HIPAA compliant sheet that says, Hey, I allow Dr. So-and-so or nutritionist so-and-so to see my data. As soon as they click that on board, you get their data streamed into your provider account and, you know, you can run reports and, and advise as you will. So that's it in a nutshell. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Let's see what other questions there are here. Yep. Um, I think we have answered most of them. There was a question about calibration. Is that something that you're able to do? That's something that's within the Freestyle Libre 3, correct? We, we could calibrate. We've kind of pushed off on it only because of there's so much 
we have functionalities that we know providers want that we're really prioritizing. And like I said, the actual raw data wasn't that significant. And then fingerprint, the fingerprint can also be off. So depending on which company you use. So it's something that we're definitely looking at. And if you are adamant and we get a lot of requests for it, we'll definitely put it on the roadmap. Okay, awesome. Yeah. We've had a question here about um, integrating the landing page into their WordPress website. Is that yeah. something that's doable? hundred percent. Yeah, we can do that. So if you want to do anything in terms of, we're very, very handy in terms of the tech side. So if you want to do anything like I want a nice shout out on my website or a link back to the landing page or integrate it into my, into my website, definitely we can do that for you. Awesome. I mean, I will, I will share. I just think that this, as I, as I said at the outset, I think this is a no brainer from a practitioner perspective. Um, the data is excellent. The fact that you can watch and, and get that that report directly from your clients, the fact that you make a little income on it, the fact that this is the most affordable um, on the market. And I can say, you know, you order the sensor, it's there within a couple of days. And even for Australia and New Zealand, so we were talking about <laughs> for Australia and New Zealand folks, you said what, it's like six to seven days, which isn't like next day, but it's not bad. Yeah, we, we always say 10 to 12 business days just to be sure. We've done no, numerous beta tests in Australia, but yeah, we've seen it definitely six six to eight days as has been a thing for sure. Yeah. Now I'd asked some questions of um, in our practitioner group and just wanted to post a couple of these or ask a couple of these here, um, and then any questions you all have, please continue to post them. Um, yeah. Someone was asking about when glucose patterns are looking great, but their weight isn't budging. Did you, have you seen this and what have you seen working in those cases? Yes. This is probably the most fascinating story I'll share. We had somebody, it was a male. He was probably er, uh, mid thirties, 270 pounds. And I have never seen better blood sugar control in my life. Like nobody had anything on this guy. It was basically like he would eat, it would go up five basis points, come back down and just stay flat. And I looked at his diet. He ate more sugar than probably all of us combined in one day. Like it was like canned peaches with sugar added because I would look at the label, right? It was like 120 grams of sugar. He would eat peach cobbler. Like it was just on rice, like massive amounts of rice. And I was like, you know, <laughs> is his blood better? I sent him every sensor. I bought three different finger pricks. Perfect blood sugar. I sent him every sensor I could, like CGM. Perfect. All of the readings were actually the same. So in that case, uh, just making my point, I actually told, called him and I said, this is not doctor's advice, but I would go check your insulin, your fasting insulin. Yeah. Some people have ridiculously like fast acting insulin that takes blood sugar down and blood sugar looks normal, but it's kind of a Trojan horse, right? Because it's not showing in blood sugar, which is what we're measuring but it could be that the pancreas is just doing overtime and overtime. And I was like, I mean, you know, he wasn't even that tall at 270 eating that kind of diet. I'm like, there's just something that's got to give here at some point or genetically just gifted, right? That's another right. thing is genes are different. He could be fasting insulin might, might've been fine. He never got back to me, but like fasting insulin could have been completely fine. And then genetically you can just do that, right? It's like one in a billion. Great. Good for you. Um, but the other things are, yeah, it, it kind of goes back to, let's say their blood sugar is good, their keto or whatever, whatever the case is, they might be just eating a ton of food, right? Just like overeating and four, four tablespoons of butter in their coffee, whatever the case is. Right. So I think there's just going to be, or like hormone disrupted, right? Like they could be their whole testosterone is like way down, maybe in like the low hundreds, but their blood sugar is okay for some reason. So there's just going to be, I think at that point as the, as the practitioner is going to be a little bit of investigation, which is like, maybe you do the insulin test. If that's okay, maybe let's check on the hormones. If those are okay, let's check on the, you know, let's look at the images of the food or are they actually eating, you know, amount that's, that's kind of fit for them, or is it just over the top? So I think it really depends person to person in that, in those scenarios. Yeah. This is where you start bringing in all of your other clinical tools too, to sort of unpack. Yeah, them. exactly. <laughs> um, Alana has a great question here about how do you recommend incorporating this into your practice? Yes. So strategies yes. for building that in. For sure. So we do have resources on this, but I would say we've, we've had it 
multiple different ways. So I'm going to assume a lot of you do telehealth or do you also do a lot of in clinic or do we know that or? the majority of our um, practitioners are virtual, but some are definitely yep. in person. Okay, cool. So we've, we've had it so many different ways where people have built us into their actual offering. So it's like part of the solution now or part of the package starter or mid or, or top tier, or it could be where the top tier package where now you have the glucose data on top of the coaching. Right. Uh, that's been one way. We, a very common one has been launching new products. So metabolic reset, you know, metabolic uh, tracking, whatever the case is. If you're on a membership model, we've had people just, you know, like two, $300 members who get X amount of things and that can be an add-on. Uh, they build that into the thing. We've had people who have 12 month courses, like super high, uh, you know, ticket stuff where they just build us into that model. Uh, yeah. We have people who just have it on the site as a one-off and promote it once in a while. So it's we made it pretty simple where you, we can integrate with your business the way that it fits the best, right? It doesn't have to be one way. Um, and we have on our back end, you can actually buy credits for people. Let's say somebody does visit you and you want to take payment, you would charge them, come and buy credits give us their name and email, and then we would just onboard them, That's right? Awesome. So we made it very flexible for you. And for, I mean, all, most of you have gone through the, some of the, you know, business and the the packages that we teach. Um, I would definitely think, especially once you've got blood chemistry under your belt, um, you could, this would be a beautiful add on to bring in the year long membership and maybe like three months of tracking or, you know, I don't know two sensors to get their baseline or, or what have you, but that, I think that would be a fantastic way to do it is just to integrate it as another value add. Yep. Yeah. I could even see it an argument for doing this as your like entry point of having somebody um, do it and, you know, have it as like a, a mini package, just the CGM with, um, you know, 30 days of nutritional support and then use it as a, as a sort of case for doing the deeper digging. So I think, uh, I think there's, endless possibilities with this. It's really exciting. Absolutely. Let me go see. Um, well, we talked about the elevated or someone with the stubborn weight with blood sugar looking good. Yeah. Um, effective strategies you've seen for people with chronically low blood sugar here. Um, but let's see what your, what, what are some of the things you see? And, and I know that there's endless variables in this, but yeah. So I think, I mean, number one, the kind of cookie cutter answer here is you just massively up their protein, yeah. you know, because then the pancreas, I'm like talking to the choir here, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be very brief in this one, which is glucagon gets produced, which can make sugar out of the protein, but you're not massively spiking it. Like, you know, some people tell people just eat sugar all the time and then it'll spike it, but then it comes way back down and it's long-term not probably not going to optimize itself. Uh, we've seen that as a like very good first kind of step. The other thing is, honestly, there's a lot of context to that where it's, if that client has maybe genetically, they can be lower, right? And that's just a consideration or they're like an avid faster. They'll do three to five day fast all the time and it goes and they feel okay. So this is where it's hard for me to say, I don't, it, it's basically, I know everyone hates this. It's like, it depends. But as you, as everybody knows, everything, everything is individual in terms of healthcare. So in those moments, it's going to be up to the provider to be like, you know, I, you know, I have a good feeling about this or let's, let's make some intervention, but those would be like kind of the three things. If they're faster, they've been doing that for a long time and they feel good and maybe up their protein and see if it helps. Awesome. Yeah. I've always been, I, I, as I shared, I was interrupted multiple times in that first night of sleep with um, uh, uh, low blood sugar alarms and yeah. um, combination of a little too much berberine managing it. But it was, it was actually very insightful. This is a really good use case. You know, I'm somebody who, when I do my blood work, my blood sugar always looks gorgeous. I had been wearing a CGM during a block of marathon training when I was in a very, very high stress situation, plus marathon training, not a really good combo. And my blood sugar for the first time in my entire life started to really elevate. And it was like nothing I was doing diet wise was bringing it down. It's just all the stress and the training. And yeah. so I started taking berberine, which is really, really effective. So effective. I mean, I'd been checking in with my blood work, but I hadn't been doing the CGM. And so I, per my blood work, everything's looking great. And then I pop in that CGM and realizing that I was way overdriving it. 
Um, so berberine, extremely effective for bringing down <laughs> blood sugar and blood sugar, and perhaps a little bit too, um, perhaps a little bit too effective. So, but it would never have had that information without this CGM. I'm seeing some technical questions here regarding the the duration of the sensors. So yes, it's two weeks per sensor. That's pretty standard amongst all of the different um, sensor companies. And then um, Melissa is asking if you have to buy the yearly package or is there a monthly option? So in order for us to have the lowest cost per CGM, we we do have to do the yearly packet, the yearly membership. Sorry, over the months, I mean it's about about ten dollars a month, right? Um, and it gives them they can so they can buy. I think I forgot to mention this. For the whole year, they can buy CGMs at $75 whenever they want. We don't lock people into, you have to get it all the time. It's whenever it's necessary or when you advise them to. So they can get it for the whole year at $75 with, with their free shipping. Uh, so the way, the way we made the model was we have to do it this way in order to, for the CGM prices to be down. And I think I really like that because of some of the other companies I've used, <laughs> I just kept getting CGMs and it was quite a process to to sort of stop the service when I didn't need them and they always came with a month supply which was two CGMs and so yeah. there was you know a lot of money going out and a lot of CGMs and it was not an easy process to stop that as opposed to here it's you can do one CGM at a time yep. when you need it and no one's going to ship you one unless you ask for it which I think is is really handy um Let's take this last question. And then um, I've shared in, I've sh shared some links, our links in terms of if you want to just try it out and go through the RWS account, totally happy to do that. And then the, the link for signing up as a practitioner to use this with your clients. Um, and we'll send that, of course, with the replay as well. Anne is asking, how long is it recommended to keep monitoring initially? That's a great question. Yeah. So I would say most, I would say maybe like 65% of providers get somebody on on a month it's we were trying to do two weeks like as the like kind of just try it out but the problem is people put it on and then you want to get a baseline and they just start getting some data and then it's done so kind of just lose momentum the one month is really nice to get that baseline and then it really like the other like 35 percent depends on what package they're running so if they're doing a three-month metabolic program then they get them on you know three months of sensors if they're doing a year they might get them uh first two months maybe and then in every quarter try it for a month uh, so it really 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 depends but very very commonly we get the one month trial and it helps that practitioner or provider understand that person's metabolic health and then from there advise what to do right and it could be hey every three months let's let's just do a check-in or oh, we're getting really good data and it's helping let's keep going or when you go on a trip because your metabolism is going to give you a mess take it for that duration we're getting questions here about wearing it in the sauna infrared versus regular sauna I've personally yes. done both and haven't seen anything other than interesting data, but is that in <laughs> water is fine, right? All the things. Yeah. So it is waterproof 100%. You don't have to worry about that. There is a technical guideline. I should 100% know this. I think I don't know it for sure, but I, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to post it later. I'll give it to you to, okay. to post, but uh, there is a technical guideline of the maximum heat it should be at or the maximum or the minimum amount of, um, freezing that it could go to we've had a lot of people wear it in a lot of saunas very rarely does it actually come undone or have a failure in those situations if they do however we have a hundred percent success rate at replacing a sensor so again we tell everybody send the clients to us to replace the sensors if they break malfunction etc um abbott's very good at just getting that done i think they just don't want the hassle of people complaining or suing them. So <laughs> they and do it. We already had Courtney mentioned earlier that she had knocked off a sensor and they, the, the customer service with replacing it was seamless and easy. So awesome. Yeah. And then last question, which I keep saying, if it says on, stays on longer than two weeks, can you keep using it? <laughs> I wish we've tried to, we've tried to uh, crack the, the code there, but the actual sensor ends like it stops working after two weeks there's no way to to change that yeah yeah awesome 
Boris, thank you so much. This is just such great data. Um, I hope th those of you who are who are, think, are interested, I really recommend trying it out, if only for yourself um, at first, just to kind of get experience of it. But I think once you see the incredible data that you can get, you're going to want all of your clients on it. I remember hearing a podcast, I'm trying to remember which one it was. I don't know, it was some biohacking podcast. I don't remember which one, but they were talking about this type of monitoring for like thyroid hormone and cortisol and insulin. And I was like, oh, can you imagine having the, because the once you start seeing the data on yeah. any of these points, you know, something like your blood sugar levels, which fluctuate, I mean, really wildly quickly. That's what, I mean, you see the inaccuracy of a finger prick test immediately when you wear a CGM is there's just no way, as you said, unless you're going to be tracking it like minute by minute, there's no way you're yeah. going to catch those fluctuations. Um, and so, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, no, I just think the data is, is absolutely excellent. You've solved some of the biggest pain points um, for us as practitioners. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, Molly, I see your question. If you use the link to test it on yourselves, yes, you do need to sign up for the year. You'd be doing it just like a client would be doing it. Um, but um, if you sign up for your clients, then you don't have to order anything. You can just start ordering it for your clients. So Although, I mean, we always think it's, it's a great idea to try it yourself if you at all can. So appreciate it. Take care, everybody.